This topic or uh, lecture is called buffers to cushion for fluctuations. Now, uncertainty, risk, variability are different ways of explaining things that you did not expect to happen, right. So, how do you go about managing when there is that kind of fluctuations and we are going to use what is called buffers to cushion for fluctuations. Now, this is a topic that is from uh, the book Factory Physics uh, by Wally Hopp and Mark Spearman. I would recommend reading that, it is a wonderful way of describing how some of this is done. Now, how do you manage uncertainty by buffering? So, if you think about any company, whether they are in production or they are in service industry, they are striving to provide what is called customer satisfaction. So, that is the most important thing for most companies because providing customer satisfaction directly uh, hits the bottom line of making profits. Okay. Now, to do that, one has to know how to manage variability, risk, uncertainty, whatever you want to call that, okay. things that you did not expect, things that you did not foresee uh, or you know things that were not according to forecast. Uh, so, those are how do you, how do you uh, go about managing those situations. Okay. Now, one way to do that is by what is called buffering. Okay. And we could do a combination of carrying inventory, having spare capacity or even relieving capacity and also by buffering by time. Okay. Uh, this may not be obvious, next we will show you 5 examples and I will explain this a little bit well. However, we more often than not do a combination, we probably do all of them uh, for the most part okay? and or any subset of them is what many times uh, organizations are involved in. So, we will do several examples and I am going to take a qualitative approach, I am not going to be quantitative. We will talk about the quantitative stuff later in the next lecture. However, in this lecture, we are going to mainly be touching upon qualitative aspects okay? and we will not say anything about quantitative stuff okay? such as how much buffer to carry. We are not going to answer that question, we are just going to answer what to do for buffering. Okay? Now, there are other things that one does to manage risk and uncertainty and variability. Uh, and uh, that is to add flexibility, we will see examples of that as well. You do not call those are buffers, so these are not buffers, this is just having very different flexibilities like a machine that can produce multiple things like a numerical control machine, the CNC machine can do many different things. So, that, that adds flexibility to your shop floor instead of buying one separate machine to do milling and drilling and uh, machining, you might as well do have three of them. Okay, I'm sorry. You have might as well have one CNC machine, uh, which uh, really offers flexibility. Or you buy three CNC machines, it could do someday all three milling and so on. So that's what is called flexibility. You could also pool risk. Okay, you there could be risky things happening in different uh, situations, and I will look at a few examples later. And it is possible to pool some of those risks together and thereby reducing. So, if you think about it, it is kind of like the effect of the central limit theorem, where you have a bunch of independent uh, uh, random variables, and if you pool them together, uh, turns out that you know some of them will be higher, some of them will be lower. So, on a aggregate level, you will actually reduce the variability and that is an important thing to consider. So, that is the uh, technical details behind all this, but from now onwards we will be purely qualitative like I said and we will not talk too much about the quantitative aspect. So, let us look at the first in, uh, example as the food industry, this is my favorite industry uh, given how much I like food, so I guess are most people. Uh, turns out that if you look at you know, things like the bakeries and fast food places, this is again perishable items like we saw in the previous lecture. Uh, people typically carry some inventory of finished products like this is, so you do not know your demand right? and uh, you are also not uh, uh, sure as to how much therefore to carry, what should be the queue. Now, it turns out that if you ordered enough so that your demand is satisfied and you might carry an inventory maybe a little bit more or a little bit less depending on uh, how your variability of your demand looks like. Okay? However, if 
this situation is even beyond that. What if you suddenly got a surge of demand that was a little bit unusual? For example, let's say it is a special time of the year and there are a lot of people visiting. All of a sudden, you get an unusually high demand. So you might carry a little bit of inventory. So this is buffering by inventory. You could also do something like in a lot of uh, fast food restaurants, actually carry pre-made stuff. They actually keep it out there so that, you know, they could go ahead and get those items instead of ordering and waiting for the items to come. So this is Im clearly improving what we call as customer satisfaction. Other restaurants also pre-make their food. It's not that everybody starts from scratch like you're cooking in your house. They pre-make a lot of items. That's why in many restaurants you have a menu card because they kind of can pre-make a lot of these things. They don't just create stuff uh, on the fly. Of course, they do finish off items. That's why you could, little bit you could do some customization. Now, that is the inventory. The second type is what's called capacity. So, Many times, you know, uh, managers help out by taking orders. You see this all the time in restaurants, right? Because all the waiters are busy helping other customers. And then you're thinking, the manager looks and says, oh, all the waiters are busy and there's a table that, you know, people are waiting to uh, hear about the menu and so on. The manager runs up and says, okay, here is uh, the menu, ma'am. Can you please uh, go ahead and take a look? And uh, one of someone else will come and take your order in a little while. So it is important that people help out and thereby increasing the actual capacity than what is there uh, available. Sometimes during holiday periods, during peak seasons and so on, you hire temporary workers uh, to come and work in your um, restaurants. Okay? So that is very common. And this way you can increase the capacity okay, very nicely. Another thing that you can do is you could buffer by time, okay? And how do you do that? Well, if your restaurant is full, you give pagers, okay? These are these little devices that you hold and light up when, you're, uh, when you have a table ready, okay? You give them that and then tell them to go. The other thing that some places do is to tell you, oh, I'm really sorry, can you, uh, would you be happy to take a delivery service? We'll offer free delivery service. Uh, so you stay at home. Uh, so let's say you call them and say, do you have a, a room for uh, a party of six? And we go, oh, I'm really sorry we don't, but if you give me your order, I'll come and deliver it for you. Of course, it takes a little bit of time, and that's why you're buffering by time. Okay, so if you're postponing a request, that is buffering by time. If you're anticipating requests and carrying inventory, that is buffering by inventory. And thirdly, if you are then and there, right here, right now, increasing uh, your service capability, that is called buffering by capacity. These are the three common ways that one buffers. Besides that, you can also do what's called flexibility. We talked about that earlier. So you could do things like, you know, you could have some general purpose tables and you could do clever assignments of tables. Say, for example, a party of two comes in, you probably will not put them in a table of where there are four seats, okay? On the other hand, if you had a party of eight, you won't have a table with eight because a party of eight is sometimes very rare in a restaurant. So what you would do is you would just configure your table such that you, you mix two tables of four together, put them together and create a, a table of eight. So this is what we call as flexibility. So you manage your variability and uncertainty using flexible, uh, flexible systems, things that could uh, work for both a small size as well as a large size. Now, another thing that a lot of restaurants do, I'm sorry if you get too excited about this, most restaurants are uh, using common bases, okay? They have the same ingredients that they're all, they all have them mixed together and then they mix them up depending on what you would like to eat. That is a way of pooling risk, okay? So you don't want to make too much of, remember I told you a little bit about uh, going ahead and uh, pre-make you don't pre-make so much. The smarter thing to do is to have some common ingredients and then use those common ingredients in order to, uh, you know, make some of your items. So that's called pooling. So you're pooling a bunch of resources together, making a lot of that so that, you know, suddenly if you had request more of one particular item, then uh, you don't have to make that, uh, but you could, you could manage the risk by pooling. Next, let's look at healthcare. Healthcare, we've all been to uh, uh, some type of a hospital or the other, and uh, they usually buffer inventory of 
patient care material. Like for example, the pharmacy in the hospital will typically have a bunch of medicines. They are not going to run looking for a medicine all the time. Whenever, you know, they not only have just enough to meet the demand, but they will carry a little bit more so that in case a few more patients happen to come, they will have some medicines in stock. However, you have to be careful. Medicines do expire, so therefore you don't carry a whole lot of inventory. You need to know how much to carry. That's why this is a pure qualitative uh, explanation, but a harder question is how much to carry because these things expire. You could also have surgical supplies. You don't want a doctor performing a surgery and realizing, oh goodness, I don't have these gloves that I need, okay? So any type of surgical supplies will typically be carried in, in large numbers. In fact, they have automated systems that will remind you to go and buy more once you start exhausting. But still, you know, to suddenly take care of a surge of demand, you typically have a lot of supplies sitting out there. You also have a bunch of gowns. You don't want a patient to come there and say, oh, we ran out of gowns. We cannot perform the surgery. It costs a lot of money to schedule a surgery. So to manage the uncertainty, you typically carry a little bit of excess number of gowns than what you typically would need on a regular day. So this is a way to carry inventory. However, there's always a cost for carrying inventory. You have to be a little bit careful about that. Another thing is to increase capacity. Very often hospitals do this. Uh, let's say, you know, there are nurses. You typically have a few extra ones so that in case we get a large number of patients or a lot of help is needed for some patients, you always need to have a few extra ones. So many hospitals, although nurses are hard to get, many hospitals end up having a few extra ones so that just in case, you know, you need a few. They also have physician assistants. Let's say the actual doctor is not able to come. Uh, maybe because they are, they are themselves unwell, then a physician assistant steps in. So any type of those types of uncertainty, you do have other people that can care for the patients. You also have buffer of, you can also increase capacity by, uh, by, by, by having uh, facilities that are, uh, uh, you know, have extra space in them. Like, you know, you have a lot more um, like operating rooms than you need. Unlikely, but you know, uh, but at least one extra one than what you typically need, okay? So the other thing as well is that uh, doctors, nurses work overtime to increase capacity because let's say you want to take care of all your patients for that day and you're not able to do it during the working hours, you will go ahead and increase capacity and thereby uh, by, by doing what we call as overtime. Another example is you could buffer by time. This is rare uh, in a healthcare situation, except for example, let's say we're talking about storing blood or storing kidneys and so on. I guess blood is still stored as inventory, but kidneys are not. Uh, for example, you won't have a kidney sitting there. It's such a precious uh, item that people will typically wait. So if somebody needs a, uh, a kidney transplant, they will wait. So you buffer by time because you would never keep, uh, you know, such a precious organ as an, as an inventory. You will always tell someone who needs it, put them on a wait list, and whenever they get a chance, they'll be matched, okay? Now, uh, turns out that there's a lot of flexibility in, in, in the healthcare industry. Uh, nurses typically are cross-trained, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, a, a particular nurse can help carry out various types of uh, um, care. For example, they could take care of patients that have, uh, uh, you know, different types of diseases, uh, just so that, you know, wherever there's a need, there's a sudden uh, uh, urgent need in one, they could do that versus what they usually do, okay? The other thing is operating rooms many times are used for multiple purposes, okay? But recently, uh, uh, I, I was familiar with a situation where, you know, they took the pediatric ward where babies are born and kind of combined it with uh, surgeries uh, that take out the uterus. It's called hysterectomy. They put the patients for both in similar rooms so that, you know, the situation is somewhat, somewhat similar, the care is somewhat similar. Uh, in the hysterectomy situation, you don't have a baby in there. Uh, however, uh, in terms of the care of the mother, in either case, is similar, so it makes sense to have multi-purpose rooms for that, okay? That's a way to manage uncertainty. Now, you do a lot of pooling. Now, pooling is very interesting. There are many ways, and scheduling patients in healthcare is an interesting topic by itself. It's, it's a, people have written papers and papers. It's a very interesting problem. However, to give you a very quick way how you would like to do um, scheduling is, you typically do back-to-back -back scheduling such that, you know, you put down one patient who has a chance of going over their time limit 
with somebody who has a good chance of being under. So, for example, you typically give, let's say, half an hour appointments to each patient. Then you would put one patient at 11 o'clock in the morning and the next patient at 11.30. You want to be sure that you don't put two patients who can possibly go well over the half an hour limit, in which case what will happen is you will start getting a cascading effect and it will be a big problem. Instead, what you do is you pair up uh, patients so that one person is probably going to be lesser, the other person is going to be greater. This is the way that you pool some of the risk associated with scheduling. All right. Let's now move on to the next example of transportation. So there's a lot of uncertainty in transportation. And uh, uh, typically, you know, if you look at trains and airplanes, uh, there are some seats that are typically kept for last minute. It's called tatkal in India. And these are last minute requests. You keep, typically keep a few seats so that if somebody needs urgently, you get that. That is typically what we call as buffering for inventory, okay? Now, Public transportation, for example, typically don't have that because there's always another bus. You could always do buffering by time. If there's no space in a bus or space in a uh, suburban train, you normally don't worry about it. You don't typically have these types. You don't even have reservation for the most part. Another thing that railways uh, do a lot of is they add and remove carriages. Okay? Uh, let's, let's say, for example, there's a peak season uh, that everybody is traveling uh, and immediately they would add a few carriages and that thereby increasing the capacity. In fact, it could go the other direction. Airlines frequently cancel flights and consolidate flights. So, for example, if there's a, a flight from, say, Chennai to Mumbai, uh, let's say there are two flights, one at 10 o'clock and one at 11 o'clock, sometimes what they would do is they would just consolidate those two flights and put them as one or they would even cancel one of the flights and just move the, um, uh, move the passengers to the next flight. This happens a lot. Airlines do one other thing a lot, which is they bump passengers because they overbook flights sometimes or there are too many people requesting. They bump the passengers and then they ask them to go later. So that is buffering by time. Uh, typically, we also do adjustment of ticket prices for time. Now, Adjusting for ticket prices is actually a combination. In fact, ticket prices, this is a very interesting concept. Uh, companies like uh, Uber, for example, have this differential pricing and depending on the time of the day, they would adjust the price. So if, for example, they don't have enough drivers, they would jack up the price so that you know people looking at it say, oh, okay, I don't want to go, uh, go look for uh, an, an Uber vehicle. That basically what you're doing by what you're doing there is you are actually we did not talk about you know pricing as a means for uh, taking care of uh, this kind of uh, uncertainty. That is also one thing. So this is a combination by adjusting ticket prices by adjust by uh, by just adjusting fares. You are buffering both by time as well as by pricing. Okay, so that's another way of doing the same thing. Now it turns out that reservation agents can be what we call multilingual. They can speak two languages. They can speak English and perhaps another language and they offer flexibility. This way, for example, let's say there are uh, there is one person who can speak both English and Hindi and there are they can cater to customers who are English speaking and Hindi speaking. That is better perhaps than having separate reservation agents who can only speak English or those that can only speak Hindi and thereby, you know, uh, you are uh, looking at this inflexible system where one, let's say, becomes too full and there are no one who can answer your question, you put the person on hold, which was something that we don't want to do for improving customer satisfaction. Oh, also, transportation um, uh, companies are benefiting by that because they really have to have fewer people in the ticketing agency by carrying a smaller capacity. So, in fact, flexibility here improves the capacity. Another thing that uh, transportation and this hospitality industry, by that what we mean is I'm clubbing transportation and hospitality into one. Hospitality means hotels typically, could be rental cars and people like that. They provide a lot of pooling. For example, let's say all the rooms in a hotel is booked. We have had to uh, do that very recently. A hotel was completely full. They would call a, another hotel nearby and say, hey, we have a bunch of extra people. Can you help us out? So these hotels help each other out so that once they get full, they transfer their um, customers to another hotel. So this is essentially pooling resources, like having a chain of hotels or chain of places that people can actually book and get served. Okay, so that's typically another example. 
Next example, I'd like to talk about what's called personal finance. Uh, this is a somewhat of an unusual example. The previous three has been researched a lot. This one I threw in, in uh, just to talk about you know, some personal situations. All of us have uh, been in these situations. Turns out we have what's called a savings account where we hold some money. We even can hold cash in our houses. This is for emergency expenses. We all do that. Why do we save? So that we want to be sure that uh, you know, we have money not just after we retire, but also, you know, just in case we have some incidental expenses or emergency expenses for some unforeseen unfortunately. So that's a way to buffer for inventory. Now, you could also do capacity. For example, you could moonlight as a cab driver. Uh, this happens a lot in the U.S. where people who are, let's say, have an Uber, uh, they could be an Uber driver at night and they could be working in their day jobs. This happens a lot. And uh, that way, they are actually increasing their capacity to earn. Some people provide like tutoring services at night, again, you know, working two shifts and thereby improving their um, ability to earn. Uh, some people retire at a later age. That's another way to improve the capacity. So if you want to stock up, uh, you retire a little bit late, you have a decent amount of money while you retire. Another way is to buffer by time. This is a little bit unusual, but thinking about, you know, okay, I want a new vehicle, but maybe I will buy it a few years later. So postponing that decision is buffering by time. You could also pay by credit card. Let's say you're waiting for your paycheck to come and you don't have money to pay for something. You pay with a credit card and then later, once the paycheck comes, you go ahead and pay the credit card company. So sometimes, you know, let's say we pursue activities after retirement. So there's something you really want to do, but you don't have the kind of time right now to take a long vacation to go around the world. You might say, okay, I might do that after I retire. So that is a way of buffering by time. Because these are things that you could do. Uh, although the retirement stuff does not seem like it's a, so let's say, it does not seem like it's an urgent emergency type situation. Turns out that, you know, if for some reason you're saying, okay, I, I really planned this, but something urgent came. That's kind of what I was thinking. You know, you planned a wonderful vacation, something urgent came up and you had to cancel it. Then you're saying, okay, I'll put it off for a later time in life. Okay. Now, there's also flexibility. Now, this is an important thing. This is, looks more like advice that I'm giving. Yes, it's important to get a broad-based education so that, you know, if one type of a job description is no longer needed, you could get a job in another company. It gives you that flexibility. It also gives you a lot of flexibility if you have the ability to do lifelong learning. So let's say tomorrow uh, nobody is using the software called Octave. Uh, you should have the ability to learn the new software that becomes popular. That is what I mean by lifelong learning. That's something that gives you a lot of flexibility of employability. Also, getting a large number of different skills is also very useful. Maybe one skill is not useful right in the future. You could, uh, you could still get a job because you have the ability to uh, go and do different things. Now, another way is to uh, pool, and this is done a lot, especially those of us that are into investing. You would invest in a bunch of different stocks so that you know, if one stock goes up, the other goes down. Uh, or something like that, you're not stuck with a negative amount of money in your balance. So, so to be careful, what you do is you actually pool your, uh, your risks. And the other thing you do is you also get bonds as well as stocks, as well as um, you know, certificate of deposits. This way, you kind of uh, diversify your portfolio, as they say, and, and this is also called pooling your resources. Next example is in retail. Uh, by retail, we mean stores that carry clothes, for example. Let's say you're a clothing store. Uh, that's an example of a retail store. So typically, they carry inventory of finishing finished goods. And uh, whenever a customer needs the item, they typically have the inventory. So, uh, for example, you know, you go to a store, you typically find the shirt that you want or the pants that you want because these typically have an inventory of those items. And uh, the way that these... Uh, retail outlets uh, manage is to carry enough amount of inventory. Usually you ask the question, do you have some of this in the back? Yeah, they typically do. They go pull out a shoe from the back because they don't want to display everything. There's not enough space. They will keep some uh, hidden inside. They're not actually hiding anything. It's just because they don't have enough space. But by carrying items in inventory, they could manage the variability and uncertainty. Another thing they do is they 
do capacity planning, especially in grocery stores and so on. You oftentimes see where the hours, uh, you know, uh, they open checkout lines, for example. They have extended hours during some time periods. They also increase staff. Uh, for some, so you may have seen this uh, sometimes. And there, some of the lanes are closed. And once the queues become a little long, they say, okay, let's improve our customer service. Let's open a few lines. And then a few lines are open. Typically, a manager comes in and helps out uh, and things like that. Okay, so that's the way to improve your capacity. You could also buffer by time. So if you cannot uh, you know, have inventory, if your inventory runs out, typically you have what is called back orders. You say, okay, sorry, we don't have it today, but I will have one delivered to you in a week. Okay, uh, if you remember from two uh, uh, topics ago, we talked about where you know a company like Dell actually always only orders this what's called back order. That means once you say what you want, it will actually uh, put together a computer and then give it to you. You could also do some type of back order. You have this all the time. If you go to Amazon.com, you click, it'll say, well, we uh, we're out of stock. We will come back later. Out of stock is essentially saying we, you buy now, but we'll give it to you later. Okay, so that is buffering by time. Now, there is also this notion of flexibility. A lot of companies, especially retail stores, carry different brands. You go there thinking, I want this particular brand, and then they say, well, we've run out of this, but we have another brand. So by offering multiple various options, that flexibility really improves the management of uncertainty. Also, we offer various lead time quotes. Okay, you, you would say, okay, for this price, I can deliver it in two days. For this price, I can deliver it in five days. So you do this type of a pricing come flexibility type of situation. You also can employ adaptive workforce, people who can adapt as they go. Uh, say, for example, you know, this is similar to people who can do different things, like they be at the cashier or they could uh, be a salesperson and so on. Another thing is risk pooling. Now, this is an antithesis to inventory in some sense. So instead of carrying inventory at the store, at the central store, you, uh, I'm sorry, this is, so, so these are, I'm sorry, this is a store, this is the invent, this is a central warehouse, and these are the stores. So let's say you have three stores in the city. Instead of carrying inventory in each of these stores in the city, you carry a lot of inventory in the warehouse and maybe go and drop off inventory at the stores whenever you need to. This is another thing that is done very often, especially in larger things such as you know, uh, in the automobile industry, for example, if you if these stores are essentially dealerships, you don't just carry a ton of them there because you know it, it is a little expensive to keep them. So you carry it in the warehouse and thereby manage your risk. So, in summary, I do want to say a few things. We have mainly presented qualitative aspects. We have really not talked about anything quantitative, but it's good to know how companies combat variability, risk, and uncertainty. This is a, a fairly standard technique. Like I said, Factory Physics is a wonderful book to read and learn more about this. We have only answered the what question. What can you do to manage uncertainty? We did not answer the question how much. We will see how to do that in the inventory case next. But on the other hand, you know, it's good to just know what all is available. There's a lot of papers that uh, uh, go into deep quantitative analysis. Some of these analyses require more uh, advanced topics such as linear programming and things like that, and therefore it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. Uh, so, so we are just keeping this to qualitative for now. A, also, the quantitative treatment is typically done on a case-by-case -case basis. It requires also a collection of a whole bunch of data. So what we would typically do is a study one particular situation and look at how best to analyze that situation. And it could be different for them as opposed to somebody else. Okay. Uh, now, uh, next is uh, we want to say a little bit about uh, what type of quantitative treatment we will, we will see and we have seen. We did see the new vendor problem. And we did manage that inventory. We saw that we did a fairly quantitative uh, analysis. Next, we will see in the next uh, lecture how to manage inventory. So we will do a little bit of the quantitative treatment. Anything that is fairly straightforward, we won't get to something really rough. I should repeat what I said in topic one, which is that there's always a trade-off between cost, 
quality and level of service. You cannot get all three. You cannot get low cost, high quality, high level of service. You have to give up on one or the other, especially when there is a some type of constraint. Okay. Now, uh, so usually you can satisfy two of the above and to model your operations, you'll have to do it in a careful way and uh, find a good way of going about doing it in, in life. So, uh, so essentially, the whole idea of doing quantitative analysis is to make sure that you find a good way to trade out between cost, quality, and level of service. Okay? So this brings us to the end of some qualitative aspects about buffering. Uh, next, we will look at some quantitative aspects of inventory management. Thank you.